Doctors advise against it, but every summer, sun worshippers flock to the beach to relax, swim, and lay in the sun. But when did getting a tan become a thing? Most trace it back to the 1920s, when iconic designer Coco Chanel got a little too much sun while on a Mediterranean cruise. Thinking she looked glamorous, legions of fans began to copy her look. For centuries before that, Europe and America's white upper classes prized pale skin as a sign they were affluent enough to laze away their days indoors instead of laboring in the hot sun. After Coco, getting a tan became proof of a person's wealth and ability to idle away days at the beach, just as bathing suits were about to get smaller. In 1920s America, women's suits were bulky, high necks and skirts with pants underneath, often made of wool. Police roamed the beaches armed with measuring tapes. Their mission? Keeping the public safe from revealing swimsuits. But all that was about to change. During World War II, wartime cloth restrictions let women shed some of the excess fabric. Then in 1946, French designer Louis Rayard unveiled the bikini naming it after the World War II nuclear testing site Bikini Atoll. Rayard said it wasn't a true bikini unless it could fit through a wedding ring. He had first had trouble finding a model for the racy suit, but once he did, the design took off, at least in Europe, where it was everywhere by the 1950s. It took another 10 years to win over America, but by the 1960s, bikini-clad teenagers swarmed to America's beaches, inspired by the exploding popularity of California surf culture. Getting elected president is an expensive business. Campaign costs add up. There are advertisements to make, travel expenses, convention costs, even bumper stickers. But where does all this money come from?